Ain't no half stepping with Marcus J. Live from the Den. Legacy Internet Radio. Thank y'all to everybody that's rocking with us tonight. As I mentioned to you guys before in the tease, we've got two members of the 1993 St. Anthony High School basketball team that won the national championship in high school. Uh, they are St. Anthony Friars, just like I am. And we, of course, are going to have a discussion about the closing of our alma mater. You know, one cat who joins us on the show quite frequently. Uh, he is, of course, a St. Anthony Friar alum, as well as a member of the Ramapo College basketball team as well. He's my brother and yours, our brother k What's up, man? What's going on, fella? What's going on? Ain't no half of the family. What's good going? to have you back. Uh, good to have you back on the line. Uh, of course, we also have joining us on the line. It's been a while since we had the brothers. Good to have him back on his home. On Ain't No Half Stabbing with Marcus J. Of course, another St. Anthony Friar. He is a member of the Duke Blue Devils, also a member of the National Basketball Association. He's a St. Anthony's legend. And uh, based upon some uh, articles, he's a top five player in the history of St. Anthony <laughs> High School. My brother and yours, Mr. Rashawn McLeod. What's up, brother? What's going on, Mark? I mean, everything good, man. Everything good. Uh, and people leave out St. John's, man. Let's make sure we get St. John's up in there, man. I spent some time there, too, man. <laughs> I know. You know what's funny? As I'm going through that, I said, you know what? I should have said St. John's as well. Most folks know you as a Blue Devil, but were you a, were you a Red Storm? What were they calling the, the St. John's back then? Actually, I, I was the I was a Red Man original, and then my second year, we I was the first – First class of Red Stone. First class of Red Stone. Did you play for uh for Lou? Yeah, I retired when I when I got there, so I ended up playing for uh, Brian Mahoney. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Well, it's a it's my pleasure and honor to have you guys um, both on the line. You know, Ro, I think this might be one of the first times, not the first time we had you on Legacy in that radio. We had you before on the station that we used to be on. Of course, Dub is a Long-time favorite to the listeners of Ain't No Half Step on Marcus. Jay, let's get right to it, y'all. I'm class of 92. Y'all are class of 93. You know, we're friars, and we got the news last week um, that the school was cl- uh, was closing this year. Rashawn, let's start with you, brother. Which, what were your initial thoughts when you got the news that it was final? Um, I was, I was a little heartbroken, you know, because uh, a place that's been – a cornerstone in the Jersey city community for a lot of, uh, great athletes and, and people, um, without a lot of options, uh, had a place of refuge where they could go feel safe and, and get their lives, have an opportunity to turn their lives around is being taken away. You know, um, my personal opinion, that place should be historically, uh, embedded into the Jersey city community because it's given a name to Jersey city for the last 30 years some odd years and uh for it to close down is is, is really heart heartbreaking because um a lot of people wouldn't know much about jersey city uh had it not been for st anthony's kate up same question pretty much the same thing that uh rose said you know um i feel felt as though that you know st anthony should have been recognized as a uh national landmark um, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, so many people have walked through those particular doors and been a different person when they walked out of those particular doors after the particular, after the time that they spent there. And, um, you know, you just look at, you know, our friendships and a number of other friendships. There's a number of people that all of us could name that have had and garnered lifelong relationships uh, with people that they that they went to school with, and for that to kind of come to an abrupt end is uh, is pretty sad. Pretty yeah. sad. Yeah, it's definitely sad. My my experience is a little bit different from you guys. Of course, I came in from my junior and senior years. You guys were already there and kind of established as ball players as well as as uh, 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 people that you know went to the to the school. But I know what you mean when you say the relationships that have been established because. Of the three high schools that I went to in Jersey City, that's the one that not just because I graduated from St. Anthony High School, but because that's where I felt most comfortable. That's where I developed, you know, the lifelong relationships that we still can share now. I graduated 25 years ago. Here we go. We still talking. You know what I mean? And we're talking not just because of the closing of the school because we'd be talking anyway, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so right. it's, it's, it's kind of like that. Let's talk a little bit about why St. Anthony is so known nationwide. Kata, 
as far as the basketball team is concerned, tell us what your thoughts are about the impact that they've had nationally or we've had nationally as a basketball power. Well, um, obviously, for obvious reasons, Coach Bob Hurley, uh, Hall of Fame coach, um, you know, we hold the record of the most state championships. I believe it's at 28 and the most national championships, which is at four. And uh, what Coach Hurley was able to do was to give options and opportunities to a lot of kids uh, to take their um, take their, their their athletic ability and move it on to hopefully – uh, becoming professional, but at the least allowing them to become basketball players and go to school for free or as close to free as possible. Whereas a number of other schools at that particular time were not able to say that they could do. You know, when Rashawn and I went there, you know, it was a situation of, okay, I know I can play basketball or whatever, and this may get, they, this will give me the opportunity to go to school for free. Right. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's one thing that the school has definitely uh, done for kids on a national level. You know, every year, doing, especially with Final Four just um, passing a few weeks ago, you know, every year we can point to a school or a number of schools that has a St. Anthony's basketball player represented on their squad. Right. Now that so, was definitely you know, a level. On the national level, that's one of the things that, that, that uh, you know, is, is, is a pride that we take in taking uh, at St. Anthony's. I'm glad you said that. My apologies for almost breaking into what you were saying. I was just going to say you get a level of pride. I remember you know, when we were coming along, just to name drop a few of our friends and people that we came along with, you know, you know, when you talk about your Jaleel Roberts and you talk about your Roderick Rhodes uh, and you talk about, you know, your Bobby Hurley's, your Danny Hurley's, you know, and then some others. Of course, you can name drop some fellas if you choose to. But, Ro, let me ask you a question. When you were a friar, did you know that it was a big deal while you were there? I mean, was it something as a ball player who went on to do the great things that you did after leaving there while you were there as a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? Did you know it was a big deal back then? Um, Not really. I didn't even go to St. Anthony to play basketball initially. I went there to play baseball. <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> uh, no, of Willie that. Banks and, uh, and Billy Bush, you know, who was my cousin who played on that team uh, in 91. Um though that was the reason I came to St. Anthony's and I grew, that summer I happened to grow you know about four or five inches um, going into my freshman year and I, I played for the Jersey City Boys Club and so I, I had just got into basketball actually that year uh, eighth grade year going down to um, going down to White Eagle in the summertime and you know just and I was terrible so I had no idea that I, what I was getting myself into right. um, and so for me uh, I was just trying to not go to Snyder High School, <laughs> which is one of the, at the time, you know, and still today, probably one of the toughest uh, high schools in our city. And uh, my mother didn't want me to go there. So the opportunity to go to St. Anthony's was really just to, you know, to be a safe haven, uh, wow. to be able to get a great education and play baseball. But basketball ended up becoming um, a love for me through the relationship that I built with Kashara and Jaleel, the guys, Roderick, the guys that you mentioned, um, you know, they taught me the game. And, I, and you know, my biggest fear as a player was not, you know, to let my teammates down. Right. And, you know, that carried me through my whole career. And with that one thought, um, I was able to, you know, create with them and coaches, Coach Gary, Coach, Ab Coach Abdullah, um, you know, Coach Eddie Rich and, you know, Coach Hurley and, you know, guys who were part of my, my career, uh, I, I was able to create something that I, I would have never been able to dream of at that age, and I didn't. And when it became a reality, it was something that I started to believe in, and, and I gave it even more and more effort on, on, a, on a consistent basis. Keeping with this one, bro, uh, I alluded to the article K-Dub and I talked about last week. We can get into it a little bit if we, if, if we choose to. But my question more so is for you on this one. You know, it was an article that was written uh, last week once we found out, and it, ra it ranked the top five uh, greatest basketball players that came out of St. Anthony High School. And we're looking at names like Roderick Rhodes, who graduated with me in 92, uh, we're looking at names like David Rivers, who we know played for the Lakers for a little while. Uh, we're looking at names like Bobby Hurley, whose name and career 
uh, goes without saying when you talk about the history of college basketball and Duke Blue Devils. Uh, we also talk about Terry DeHair, who was drafted and played for the Clippers and had um, and had a decent career in the National Basketball Association. And you also have the name Rashawn McLeod, who also had uh, a decent career in the National Basketball Association. Now, it's one man's opinion, but if I had written that article, that's probably the five that I would have come up with. What's your thoughts on that list or any list like that? Um, I think, you know, with time, um, the list can always change. Um, I think um, with the, the, the five that you named on that list, you know, you could easily change two or three of those guys and, and add, uh, you know, other guys on the list like Kenny Wilson or or Mandy Johnson or, you know, Jerry Walker or Jaleel Roberts <laughs> easily could have been, um, you know, and, and that's only – but I think what the article – you know, shared was how we were able to take uh, what we learned out of St. Anthony's um, <clears throat> and, and really transform that into lifestyles. Right. You know, I think we did those things that the guys on that list did that the best, but I wasn't the best player on my freshman team. I wasn't the best player on the, on the JV team and I wasn't the best player on my varsity team. So, right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I am appreciative of, you know, the thoughtfulness of uh, the people who would, when you're looking at a body of work, I did, I, I had the longest, uh, I had the longest trip in the shortest amount of time because I didn't play basketball until I got to high school. Um, so I, I didn't play as long as a lot of those other guys played, um, but I was able to um, achieve a lot of things that the guys who played longer than I did um, weren't, were not able to achieve at the highest levels and playing in the NBA and, a high level, some you know the highest level going to, um, you know the the NCAA double A tournament, being number one in the country, playing with Shane Battier and guys like that, Elton Brand, and um, so I think I, I I made the most of what I had in such a short period of time. So I think that that's really what made it creative, and me getting on that list, and um, you know, but it was a great process, and I'm happy to be on that list. Yeah, I think it's great, and I think that. Uh, you did an outstanding job with the skill set that you had. And, you know, one of the things that I could say, because I watched you, uh, you worked hard, you know, I mean, you worked hard, you always worked hard. And, you know, you were one of those players that you knew that you were fundamentally sound. And when you have fundamentally sound players, they're, they're oftentimes the ones uh, that have longevity in their career. You did a whole lot uh, with with little as you mentioned since you kind of got a late start and you know half stepping with marcus j live from the den of legacy internet radio we're talking to our brothers kashar wilson we know him as k-dub and of course we're talking to our brother ro we know him as rashawn mcleod of the saint anthony friars of which we are all alumni of we got word recently that our alma mater is going to be closing and of course uh, the national basketball powerhouse they are in high school is definitely a sad time for those of us that are a part of the Friar family. Dub, I'm going to bring you back in here. One of the things that I always would get a kick out of, obviously you and I, our relationship predates even our days as Friars. I mean, we were friends when we were toddlers, but I used to always get the stories. So that's what I want. So, Ro, while I'm talking to Dub here, I want you to be thinking about the stories. Um, I, I want to get a story about the St. Anthony's gym. And we know that St. Anthony's doesn't have a gym, but give me a story of the St. Anthony's gym and why tell the listeners why I'm setting it up that way. Well, uh, St. Anthony's gym really isn't a gym. Uh, at the time when we were there, we actually practiced in the uh, bingo hall, white Eagle hall. And um, what we would have to do is uh, go in the gym uh, take the tables and the chairs, put them up on the uh, on the stage, roll out one rim because one rim was already kind of bolted to the uh, to the, the I guess you could say the balcony, and we would go in there and work hard in a court that was probably maybe three fourths size of a real court. There were no out of bounds. There was no foul. You go in there, play shirts and skins, beat beat some people up. Uh, especially with people that weren't from St. Anthony's, we would just kind of just uh, it would be quote unquote what we used to call jail ball, but with a little bit of rules. Then after p playing for about two and a half, three hours, we would 
eventually go and have to put those tables and chairs back up, getting uh, splints and all types of things or what have you. Uh, I would venture to say that each and every player that has ever played or practiced in White Eagle has what we call a White Eagle scar. Uh, I have a uh, probably about a two to three inch gap on on my leg right now from being uh, pushed into a heating vent. Uh, I actually have some stitches in my hand from uh, the other individual that's doing the in, doing the interview with Sean McLeod. Uh, <laughs> I have stitches where I split the webbing of my my finger, or my, I should say the webbing of my hand. But, um, you know, the thing about that particular gym is that you would be 14, 15, 16 years old, walk into the gym, and you don't know who would be in the building. We could walk in one day and have Coach Krzyzewski and Bob Knight sitting on the sideline, and uh, we could have, you know, Grant Hill or, or even um, local basketball players in the gym. And no matter who you were, uh, no matter what your status was, whether you was just playing on TV a week before or you were a freshman or sophomore in high school, you know, everybody was equal and everybody went at each other hard. You know, you could be a freshman and it, 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 you could have a situation where you're matched up against Roger Rose, who, who may be the best player in the nation at the time. Or you could be matched up against uh, someone that plays for the University of North Carolina. I mean, there's there's a number of different uh, uh, scenarios, a number of different stories that we've had in there. It really did not matter who you were. You just came in and played basketball. You played hard for right. for those particular minutes. And through that, it allowed you to get tougher. Right. It right. allowed you to, you know, become more of a solid basketball player, but more so of a man. There were no excuses. Like I stated, there's no foul, you know, uh, and there's no out of bounds. So you have to survive in that in that box while you were there. Right. And I think that was one of the things that led to the success of us as a basketball school. Well, I should say us as a basketball team because we were given so little. So when we had the opportunity to go out there and show what we do, we went out there and showed it to the best of our ability and came back to our box and, and, and fought and battled and, and worked even harder every day. You know, so... You know, uh, White Eagle was, it, it, granted, it was a building, a physical building, but, you know, a lot of the things that you learn out of there, it, it's just, it's unmatched. Rajon, do you have any White Eagle Hall stories? Um, I mean, yeah, I got about seven zillion White Eagle Hall stories, <laughs> but, I'm, you know, but we'll, we'll focus on one. Like, so the thing I remember most is becoming a senior and not have to put the tables up anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was kind of like a rite of passage, you know, like you, 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 you paid your dues and, you know, freshmen, sophomores and juniors are going to pick the tables up because you were, you know, it was almost like a graduation. Right. And, uh, but the funny thing is sometimes as seniors, we'd still help because we were excited about, getting on the court we would never help put them back down but we would always help pick them up right. because we wanted to get on the court really really fast and we didn't want to take more time than it was necessary right. so we could get on the on the floor and do battle um you know uh, a story for me personal story for me was more uh, i remember being a, a sophomore and i really didn't enjoy playing because i wasn't that good at the time and uh and didn't i didn't like looking bad and we had a bunch of coaches in the in the gym, um, and and I loved playing video games and still do till today. Not as much, but I still do. And uh, I was just ruining the day, and all the coaches were there, and Coach Hurley would say to me, he stopped, and he was like, Danny, what is McLeod's problem? And Danny held up all his thumbs and was twiddling his thumbs, saying, too many video games. <laughs> and he was like, I'm going to tell every coach in here that McLeod doesn't want to play basketball. He'd rather have a career inventing and playing new video games. <laughs> and uh, and, it, and it, 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 But it motivated me to kind of, you know, put basketball on a, on a plane that, you know, that allowed me to stay focused. Right. And, uh, and, and that, that moment, really put it in perspective for me that I wasn't giving basketball a chance because I didn't watch basketball as much as, you know, my, my uh, friends. And But the more I started watching, the more I started playing, the more that, you know, they would grab me out of the house and come pick me up and drag me down to, down to the court. Right. I, I appreciate those moments. So White Eagle Hall was one of those moments right. where, you know, Kashara and Jalil and, and Halim and, 
you know, Jamal Curry and guys like that would they would, man, you better get down to the gym and you better be there. And they didn't give me they didn't give me much of an option not to do it. So that's my white my my white eagle hall memory, man. I can do um it. you know, that that I'd like to share. But that's it made me a man. You know, I remember and it, being it in. held me accountable and it, it made me responsible because the thing the other thing that White Eagle Hall did for us was uh, even though we didn't have out of bounds and even though we didn't have fouls, we were still forced to play the game the right way. Right. Right. Uh, we didn't we didn't take advantage of the fact that we couldn't foul or we, we couldn't you know, there was no out of bounds. We still learned to play within the guidelines of rules that were gonna be created for us but without boundaries. Right. And right. and that's the thing that I could say that we took from White Eagle Hall and we still try to analyze use that to our advantage as adults and we try to instill that to the guys that that play came after us, but also the kids that for right now as coaches we want to give them that same that same uh m- you know, mainframe so that they can have success too. Right. And and Marcus J, I would be remiss you know, I know that we're basically talking about, you know, the basketball program under Coach Hurley, but we would be remiss to not name other athletes that have gone there from Willie Banks yep. that went on to play for the Yankees. Um, even uh girls basketball, you had Nyree Roberts who went on to play with the Houston uh Rockets Comments, before yeah. that. Uh, well, Houston, as well as Houston had, Comments, man. Houston, Houston Comments, Comments, I apologize. <laughs> and went on and played overseas. You she had uh, Lisa too. Simpson who went on and played at uh Kentucky and even all the way back to uh, my freshman year, Kim Lee, Kim that Lee. went on and played at uh, Seton Hall. Yep. And um, there were a number, number of other athletes that played there, even, um, and I, his name uh, uh, leaves my mind right now, but there was, uh, I want to say, a uh, guy that played for the uh, Boston Red Sox. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, years John, before John, got there as well. John uh, Call- Callender. John, I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember right now. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. you know, he, there he was were a number we got of different there, yeah. people that have that have uh, walked those halls as well. That add to the the legacy and the lore of St. Anthony's High School as well. I want to share the football team that they 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 developed over the last couple of years, and they've had a lot of success. And then the football program as well. Um, you know, they've in the, in the first couple of years they competed and uh, at a high level um, mm-hmm. where. You know, when we were there, that we didn't even have a football team. But the thing about St. Anthony's is, it didn't matter what was developed. You know, you, the kids and the, and the people who were there gave it a hundred percent all the time. All the time. Mm-hmm. Ain't no half step on Marcus J. Live from the Den Legacy Internet Radio. We're talking to Rashawn McLeod and, K- and Kashara Wilson, reference to uh, St. Anthony High School, the Friars. We're all Friars, and their imminent closing. I got my own White Eagle uh, Hall story to tell. It's very, very brief, but. Uh, I wasn't blessed with height like you guys were, but I was still an athlete. I played baseball. I was on the baseball team. And we actually had baseball practice in White Eagle Hall. Now, the listeners heard you guys describe how small it was for you couldn't even have full a free a, a, a full court you know, game in there. It was too small for that. So if you can imagine, you know, 10, 15 kids throwing hard baseballs around that room and how – potentially could bounce off a wall and snap a kid in the head and all kinds of stuff. And I just remember never being able to focus on baseball in that place because it was just crazy. And I remember doing the tables and stuff just like you guys did. So uh, real quick, before we move on, I got one last question I want to ask the two of y'all, but I got one that I want Kate up to kind of expand on as we get close to a close. Um, uh, uh, Rashawn, you alluded a little bit to the humor of of, of Coach Hurley. Uh, Kate Up knows my favorite Coach Hurley story that occurred after you guys had graduated and you guys were there for Open Gym. Kate Up, you know the story I'm telling. Can you share yeah, this story yeah. with the listeners? This is one of my favorite stories. Well, uh, you referring to my name? Yes, I am. <laughs> well, um, anyone that um, <laughs> anyone that was around the basketball program knew, and that was for obvious reasons, my name isn't the real easiest uh, name to pronounce. So uh, throughout my whole high school career, uh, Coach Hurley didn't really pronounce my name correctly. So, uh, you know, uh, we graduated, wound up graduating, and one of the things that – happens among basketball players is that even though we graduate going to college and you know whatever career that you choose to go into you always wind up going back playing and going back and playing with the kids so this particular day uh it just so happens that a number of us that had went on to college we all came back in the gym and we were playing and uh coach early said something and he wound up saying my name correct 
and he said it exactly how it was how it was meant to be said. And you could almost hear a pin drop. It sounded like the record skip. <laughs> People were looking at me like, oh, so he did know how to say your name. And I'm standing there like, wow, all four years, he never even said my name correct. But this particular time, he chose to, 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 to say it the correct way. But, you know, that's a little bit of a microcosm. And I, I, um, I go back to a guy named jo- uh, Gary Dunbar, which what we call, we call him the Kobe stopper. Because uh, he he wound up holding Kobe Bryant his senior year to like 11 points. But anyway, something that Gary and I always used to say is that during your time there playing for Coach Early, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, once you got out into the real world, there was pretty much not a lot that anybody could say to you that would actually, you know, move you. You know, uh, uh, I'm not I'm not going to repeat a number of things and adjectives and, and pronouns that Coach Early would use to describe you or talk to you. But then as you got a little bit older, it's really not much anybody can say to get you mad, to get, you know, to get up under your skin because of the fact that at a young age, we were just, you know, you just <laughs> we, were, we, were, uh, we may have been young, but uh, we weren't talked to as if we were young. So, yeah, that. That, that was one of the stories. Uh, I won't get into how he said it or what have you, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, we can, we can hold on. We can hold on to that uh, one. Use yeah, my we, name correctly. We'll hold on to that one. I just I love that story, yeah. and I just, yeah, get, yeah. I just get a kick out of it. That'll be between us, but the, I think the listeners got to that. Uh, see, <laughs> you got to have one. Gotta that have is one. always <laughs> one. All right, listen, final, final question, and I saved this one for the end just because it's 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 kind of a difficult topic and i know dub you and i always talk about this in other areas of media and social and the like and there are going to be a lot of people that are going to say that saint anthony high school has a hall of fame basketball coach it has two of the hall of fame basketball coaches sons are now coaching in college They've had several players that had very successful, prominent college careers uh, and a few that actually played the National Basketball Association. With all the relationships that these people have developed, why couldn't there be some sort of way to fundraise to a point where the school does not have to close? Difficult question. Rashawn, I want you to answer it first. Um, I think – that question is a political question. You know, uh, if you understand politics, um, you know, I, 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 I want to believe that St. Anthony's will not vanish. It may change and evolve to fit um, the community that it's in. Um, that's the first thing. And uh, the second thing is, is um, you know, with the location of St. Anthony's being three blocks away from uh, the Holland Tunnel, um, it's, it's prime real estate. And, uh, with the 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 way that the the Catholic Church has been dealing with a lot of issues and things that have been going on financially with them, uh, you know, selling that that plot of land is is better is is, is a, big, a bigger benefit than it would be having St. Anthony's continue the legacy that it's established. That doesn't benefit the Catholic Church financially the way that. Um, the way that selling that piece of property for what they probably paid for it <clears throat> whenever they bought it. Uh, so I, I think it, it's really a, a bigger picture than um, who, who, who could help keep St. Anthony's alive. Right. Uh, the fact that St. Anthony's is, is, is closing. It, I don't think that's a testament of St. Anthony's dying. I think it's just a test. It'll be a testament of St. Anthony's moving and, and evolving um, into a new location at some point. So, because it, it, it's it, it's too tough. The people there are too tough to to allow St. Anthony's to die. Um, and and I, and in real life, I think the people who have had success realize that you find out who you really are when you know when you're in your darkest moment. And I think this is the darkest moment for St. Anthony's. And and I think that will will rise from any of the ash that'll be there. Uh, and, and continue to be great because the people um, have done a great job uh, preparing the young people and, and putting a footprint into the community um, of Jersey City. Dub, we, you and I have had similar conversations even before we knew about the circumstances surrounding our alma mater. And one of the things that has always kind of come out of our conversations is that you can't tell another man how to spend 
you know, his money or another woman how to spend her money. Uh, so I guess the point I'm making is if the folks who may know what's going on made a choice not to financially, you know, contribute, then then so be it. You can't blame anybody. What's your what's your thoughts on kind of the question? Rose response, my thoughts, your thoughts all together, kind of put a bow on it. It's the final question, the final answer before we wrap up. Well, I, I agree with uh, what Rose said um, in regards to the financial aspect of it. You know, um, we all know that this is not anything new in regards to St. Anthony's needing funds in order to continue uh, for the school years. Um, but I think that it was just a combination of timing and, um, you know, other things that were taking precedence. You know, I think a big uh, elephant in the room is this situation in regards to the Catholic Church. And, you know, and let's not let's not be, you know, fooled. It's not just St. Anthony's in Jersey City that's closing. You know, you have other schools that have closed, other Catholic schools that have closed in recent years. And St. Anthony's, along with uh, Marist and Bayonne, will be closing their doors this summer as well. So it's not just the St. Anthony's problem. It's a bigger problem in regards to the Catholic Church. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I, you and I have had discussions about was that, you know, it seems as though that no matter how much money was being donated, was being uh, offered or what have you, it pretty much was not, you know, not going to stop the closing of the school. So, you know, um, and similar to what Rose said, you know, there are there is a political aspect that comes into play as well. Uh, and the school being right there, right. All, I mean, you could literally walk to the edge of Jersey City and look into Manhattan, just, you know, no more than three blocks away from the school. So that offers an, uh, another uh, option to the city. You know, they would definitely get more money from it if that particular building was not there or if the building was converted to something else. Right. So, um, you know, I, I say again, it was, it's a number of different things. And I think it was a, um, a uh, tsunami of different things happening at the same time, which resulted in the school to be closing. Um, there are some things out there that have been talked about in regards to the school moving, uh, but that's that nothing has been necessarily uh been put in stone as of yet. Um, so, you know, again, I, I would say for any St. Anthony alumni, you know, that's there, you know, granted, the bricks may come down, but, you know, our memories that we had while we were there will always continue to, you know, keep keep us bonded, keep us in the bond, you know. And, um, you know, it's a sad day, uh, but we have to take that on and, and look toward the future and hopefully the school will be moved. Uh, but again, we still have our memories and we still have the relationships that we, uh, that we put together while we were within, uh, within those three floors. I got you. I got you. Ain't no half stepping with Marcus J live from the Den legacy internet radio. I want to take this opportunity to reflect and thank you both. I mean, we were usually referred to our brother K dub as K dub, but for the purposes of the more official, interview that we're doing we're going to thank our brother Kashara Wilson and our brother Rashawn McLeod of the 1993 national championship team in high school for the St. Anthony Fly uh, Friars uh, we look forward to an opportunity to speak with you each again I want to thank you uh, sincerely f on behalf of the entire crew here at Legacy Media Group and in, in, in Legacy Internet Radio and Ain't No Half Step with Marcus J for being on the show tonight thank you gentlemen I appreciate it Appreciate you, bro. Problem, hold, the, man. hold the line for me for just a second. Ain't no half step with Marcus J. Live from the Den. Legacy Internet Radio. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we got more of the show. You're listening to the flagship show of Legacy Internet Radio. It's called Ain't No Half Stepping with Marcus J. That's me, y'all. Be back in a few. <laughs> 